And now, uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Arthur Acker to kickstart our day with his talk on privacy and ultimate limits of secrecy. Uh, Arthur, the floor is yours. Right. So many thanks for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, I guess um, uh, it, it may be slightly different. It's not a very technical talk, even though um, for those of you who are interested in technical details, I'm quite happy to pause at any point and, and, and go into those details. But uh, essentially, my, my purpose here is to give you some kind of a, an overview or perhaps a journey that quantum crypto made over the last uh, 30 years or so. And so I'm going to talk about um, how, um, in a rather surprising way, quantum physics entered the whole field of secure communication and how I think probably at the end of the day, it may even offer the, the ultimate limits for privacy and, uh, and security. So if you're completely paranoid about security, I think you should study quantum physics. So that's, you know, that's like uh, uh, one message to take home from this talk. Um, so let me, let me just um, start with some kind of a historical perspective. If you, um, you know, human beings, of course, have a tendency to have secrets and wanted to communicate secretly. And if you go back to history, there's a, just a wonderful, wonderful, um, historical narrative about uh, how humans uh, try to uh, communicate in, in, a, in a super secret way. But the question always remain whether there is a method for absolutely secure communication. And, uh, and as you probably know, if there's any lesson we learned from history that whenever we came with any ingenious method of encryption, then sooner or later people came up with even better or more ingenious or more insightful, or more interesting method of breaking that cipher. So there's this um, struggle between code makers and code breakers uh, has been going on for centuries. And on this slide here, I just was, you know, I showed you that, you know, from about 400 BC when the Greeks came with the Scytale to um, all the way through breaking Enigma ciphers and, um, and looking at sort of a public key cryptography today and thinking, um, you know, what about quantum technology? Perhaps quantum computers can uh, handle uh, some of them. Uh, we know that indeed, if we have quantum computers, um, then we should be able at least to tackle the, the most of the existing public key crypto system. So the hence incentive to design um, good classical system that would just be robust to quantum attacks. But that's, that's another story. So as it happens in this path, the, one of the latest addition to um, a a encrypting method is, is quantum quantum crypto. So I'm going to uh, say a few words about uh, how it all uh, started and uh, where it is now and where hopefully it's going and uh, and, and share some uh, hopefully enthusiasm about uh, uh, progress in technology that can make it really happen. So now, probably for most of you, this slide is redundant, but uh, but let me just, for consistency of the talk, let me just put it put it here. Um, of all method of secure communication, as you as you probably know, the one that is proven to be secure in information information theoretical sense is is one time path, where a message is encrypted by uh, a unique uh, key that is distributed. It's just, it's just the key is a random sequence of. Uh, say binary digits uh, that are shared between two potential users um, that say Alice and Bob and uh, a simple Alice as you can see on the on the left hand side can take a message and uh, encrypt using her, crypt, her key and get the cryptogram now assuming that the key bits are truly random the randomness is basically transferred to the cryptogram so so to whoever sees the cryptogram, the, the, the yellow thing that goes from Alice to Bob, sees essentially a random piece of uh, binary string. And for Bob, who has exactly the, the same key as Alice, this randomness is subtracted at, at the decryption part and the message is recovered. That, of course, leaves us with a famous key distribution problem. So we say, well, that, that would be fine. That would be perfect. We would have a perfect cipher. Um, not the most efficient one, but still, it would be a pretty good cipher if we could only solve the key distribution problem, namely how Alice and Bob 
can distribute those random sequences of zeros and ones um, in such a way that that uh, that, that that is secure. And of course, you know, all the time um, people try to um, find solution to it. So essentially, um, if you have this key distribution problem, then um, the, you know, the way at least I see it today were well, just two ways of handling it. One is just to um, go around and, and simply design a system that doesn't have uh, a need for the key distribution per se. So that's a public key crypto system. And the other way is to fix the problem of the key distribution directly. And that's uh, what quantum cryptography is trying to do. So on the, if you look um, on the, on the left-hand side of this diagram, the public key crypto systems um, essentially do not require the, um, the, the key distribution per se, but uh, certainly, uh, they they are based on a certain assumptions which are rooted in the computational theory of complexity so they they do not that they there's no like a proof of security there's just a belief that the certain mathematical problems are difficult and then of course you know that raises the question are they really difficult are they difficult with respect to say classical devices how about quantum devices so um many of those public key crypto systems, and we know that will be um, vulnerable to quantum attacks, so including RSA, elliptic curves, and many others. Um, and uh, again, as you probably know, uh, the, the game in town is to design crypto systems uh, that will uh, be immune to quantum attacks. That, that, that quite often goes under the label of post-quantum crypto, and most of you probably heard about NSA competition or open call for proposal and uh, and and who knows you know there, there may be systems that whether we will be able ever to prove that they are that they can resist quantum attack is another story but perhaps we can find a pretty good candidate be it sort of a lattice based crypto and the like so I'm not going to talk about that part of um, of, of of cryptography about public key crypto system or post quantum crypto is you know it's that would be another talk, another lecture, but a fascinating one, certainly. Instead, I'm going to concentrate what you see on the right side of this diagram. So how quantum crypto is trying to fix the key distribution problem. And, and there are essentially um, two types of quantum crypto. One is based, one, we call it um, prepare and measure, and the other one is based on distributing of quantum entanglement. Um, the, the prepare, and measure type is um, is prone to uh, side channel attacks. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, uh, and it's um, so it's it's not that I'm just trying to uh, say that the entanglement base is uh, way superior. Actually, it is way superior, but 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 you know it's not uh, it's it's not like a it's not a part of um, my propaganda or narrative is just simply the case that uh, uh, that entanglement that I'm going to focus on and try to explain how it works uh, offers new possibilities that we hopefully will be able to explore. So that's like the bird view, uh, sort of like a, a global map, um, how we deal with the key distribution problem today. So let's let's focus then on quantum crypto. As I told you, the, the story of quantum crypto is um, goes back to roughly in seventies, where Stephen Wiesner published a paper that well, actually he didn't publish. He wrote a paper, and uh, it was not published for a long time because it is always uh, or quite often the case when you come up with something interesting and and you want to publish it, it's usually. Um, your peer review is not necessarily very favorable, and that, that that's that's what happened to Steve. Um, then, uh, as it happened, as he had a good friend, Charles Charlie Bennett, who 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 found about his work, and and then Charlie, together with Gilles Brassard, worked a little bit further and proposed um, this um, prepare and measure key distribution systems in in 1984. Well, independently, I you know I was working on uh, I was uh, intrigued by possibilities that quantum entanglement can offer, and just and propose another system which is based on entanglement. Um, 
Today, we view that all prepare and measure systems can be phrased in terms of the entanglement based system. So, um, and as certainly an entanglement based system gives to leads to the to something that I want to focus today on on to, to devise independent kind of crypto, which would be like a holy grail if we can actually build devices in 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 um, in this area in this uh, that that can deliver device independent uh, cryptography. And uh, so to just conclude this sort of like uh, introduction for me, it is also very interesting to uh, time. I have to say that uh, I started working on or, or in this field, uh, I just, you know, come to think about it about 30 years ago. And just, I, I, you know, I do feel like dinosaur at this point when I'm talking about this. So it all started in Oxford in 1991. And, uh, and about two years ago, I really enjoyed to see something that I proposed in 1991 implemented on a large scale by, uh, by the key distribution from the Chinese satellite. And um, I have to say that uh, back in 1991, I never thought that it would ever happen. I thought it would be just like a blue sky research, but it did happen. So that's another lesson learned that never ever underestimate your colleague experimentalists. Um, you know, we theorists have this kind of um, quite often nonchalant approach to, to our um, experimental colleagues. We think that they are just, you know, drilling holes and fixing optical benches. But in fact, uh, they um, they have amazing, amazing abilities to turn some crazy ideas and turn them into reality. So I, I have a full admiration for experimentalists and, and engineers. OK, so um, let me then try to uh, explain to at least to those of you who are not familiar with this field um, how it works. And uh, so maybe one more historical remark is that I think that um, if Einstein knew about uh, secure communication, he could probably come up with this idea back in 1935 because my inspiration was entirely based on, on his paper. Um, so Einstein wrote the famous paper with two colleagues of his, with Podolsky and Rosen in 1935. And in this paper, Einstein was interested in, in, he was sort of trying to digest quantum physics and, and see whether, well, actually he was trying to, to prove that it is not quite the ultimate uh, theory of reality, that, uh, that is not complete, that there is something missing, that is phenomenological, that is not really the, the, the final theory of how, how things can work. And he was constructing all kinds of interesting paradoxes. And one of them was, um, based on the distribution of uh, entangled, uh, well, one was actually in the original paper, it was just about entanglement. And, and the question he was um, trying to um, address in this paper was whether physical objects have properties which are well defined. So, you know, our classical intuition tells us that, of course, physical objects always have properties. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether we look at them and then measure, and, and, and it is not the act of the measurement that creates a property. Um, we do believe our intuition tells us that uh, physical reality somehow exists prior to any measurements and is independent of our action of measurement. And, and the properties do exist um, prior to you measuring them. Um, but that, you know, the story is not as simple as that. It turns out that if you, if you start playing with this quantum entanglement, the, the, the reality is not exactly what you expect to be from the classical point of view. And we'll just make connection to um, cryptography in a moment. But, but essentially, um, my inspiration came from the sentence which I highlighted here in this paper, which uh, Einstein was trying to um, define something that he called the element of reality. And he said, uh, in, you know, the definition goes that if without in any way disturbing a physical system, we can predict with certainty um, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to a physical quantity. So in other words, um, if we can make predictions about certain properties saying um, about the value of something that you can measure, uh, then there's element of physical reality, but 
the, the key thing here is that we are not supposed to disturb this in any way. So we are supposed to learn and leave it as it is. So to me, it was always like a definition of per perfect eavesdropping. That's exactly in adversarial scenario what, what, what your enemy would like is, is, is aiming for, right? It's just trying to measure something, measure the signal without uh, disturbing the signal, without uh, letting you know that the signal was disturbed in any way. So to predict the um, the value of a physical property in which you encode information, because information is physical, so there's always a physical carrier of information. And if that can be done without disturbing it, uh, then, then somehow this physical property that you use to encode information has this element of physical reality. And uh, so that was like the starting point of the story. And uh, let me just, you know, then illustrate the basic concept, perhaps in a, in a more modern way. Um, so consider a, a single unit of light, a, a photon. And uh, consider a, um, a property of a photon, a binary property, which is called a polarization of a photon. So that's an interesting property of a photon. We can, and you know, it just photon doesn't have just one polarization, but it has, we can measure polarization along any direction. So we just have a measuring device. We choose a direction, a sort of orientation in space. And when we measure a photon's polarization, we always get two values. We can call them zero one or plus one and minus one. It doesn't matter really how you, how you label them, say plus one or minus one. So in any measurement, we can get only two results. So the question then is, okay, prior coming to this detector that you see on, on the diagram, is there polarization there? Then you say, well, obviously there is, right? Because uh, what's going on here in this case is that a photon is carrying this polarization and the measurement is revealing this value of polarization that, that, that the photon is carrying. Um, well, the things are not completely as simple as that. So it turns out that the physicists can set up experiments where they take two photons. They come from a source. Uh, we call this source a source of um, well, entangled photon. It's usually a, these days is, is a process called parametric down conversion, where you have a crystal, you shine a laser on a crystal, and each atom in a crystal will then just absorb a photon from a laser and just emit two photons in, in, in two directions. So then we ask the question, okay, well, uh, the, we have two photons now coming from this crystal, then um, do, they, do they carry predetermined values of polarization? And uh, about 60 years ago, well, well, Einstein sort of, when Einstein was asking this question, it was still a very philosophical question. So people didn't know really how to answer this question. But about 60 years ago, an um, Irish physicist, John Bell, said, well, actually, you know, it's not a philosophical mumbo jumbo. We physicists can actually really um, look into this seriously because it is a testable proposition. In principle, you can set up an experiment in which you can measure something and this experiment will tell you whether there is a physical property prior to the measurement or not. You know, it, it sounds weird, right? So it's, it's just, um, it's amazing insight and, and uh, of, of John Bell and the, the beauty of the whole thing is actually very, very simple. It doesn't involve any sort of like a quantum rocket uh, mathematics to just derive uh, what is known today as Bell inequality. So, so John Bell said, actually the way to do it is to test for the degree of correlations between spin measurements or polarization measurements, also in this case, polarization measurements between those two photons that come from, from this crystal. So here is um, just one slide to those of you who never came across Bell inequalities, which is, um, which in my view is, is one of the most profound statements about the nature, but, um, but here you, so, so here is your golden opportunity, just one slide introduction to Bell's inequality. Um, so think about it this way. You have those two photons coming from a source and one photon goes to Alice, the other one to go, goes to Bob. And Alice is going to measure um, a polarization of some type. So call it A1 or 
A2. So she's going to choose and randomly and independently from Bob whether she's going to measure polarization along direction A1 or A2. And the same Bob the, for, for Bob. For Bob is going to choose between B1 and B2. Now, um, for every single measurement on Alice and Bob's side, you have two outcomes, call them plus one or minus one. So um, we are now, we will be now interested in, in, in correlations, but uh, before we go into this point, uh, or, or the way we will just um, look at uh, those correlations, we look at another random variable. You may, by the way, you may think about A1 and A2 and B1 and B2 as a binary random variable, right? Because what, when, when Alice is measuring A1, she's getting two values, either plus one or minus one. And they are completely um, equally likely that, and the same for A2, and the same for B1, and the same for B2. So those are just binary random variables. Now construct another random variable S that is equal to, and, and uh, that's A1 times uh, B1 plus B2 in brackets plus A2 B1 minus B2 in brackets. So you can see this expression here, and. Uh, when you look um, at uh, the, given that A1, A2, B1, and B2 can only take two values, each of them can only be plus one or minus one, then it's very easy to see, in fact, that uh, if uh, all those values do exist, you know, for a mathematician, it doesn't make sense what I said, but, but you know, for a physicist, it means that, you know, somehow they do pre-exist prior to the measurement. So there is really, you attribute to A1 either plus one or minus one, and you attribute to B1 also either plus one or minus one and so on. So if, uh, if this is the case that, that, that you can attribute numerical values to A1, B1, A2, and B2, then you can see that S can only take two values, either plus two or minus two, right? So Imagine then you just run this experiment and you are interested in, what, in, in the average value of S. And because there are only two values S can take, that is plus two and minus two, then the average value is somewhere in between those two extremes, right? But somewhere in between minus two and two. And it's just, it's just simple. It's just like the basic probability theory that uh, a child can be taught this. And, uh, and here comes uh, a profound statement that S is somewhere between minus two and two. This is called Bell's inequality, believe or not. And of course, you know, that would be such a trivial mathematical statement that would, nobody would even pay attention to it, except that nature doesn't simply play by the rules of the regular probability theory. We know this, that the way we calculate probabilities in quantum theory is different. Uh, we, we, one of the one of the axioms of the probability theory, the Kolmogorov additivity axiom, is not uh, something that nature cares about. Actually, it, you know, it violates it in, in most experiments, most interesting quantum experiments. So anyway, so this is actually the origin that that if you it it is a true it is an experimental fact or, or a prediction coming from a quantum theory that. Um, that that is not actually quite the case that if you do the calculations or if you uh, the quantum predictions are such that this s doesn't sit between minus two and two but in a somewhat larger interval between minus two square root of two and two square root of two so if we can set up an experiment and we see the average value of s exceeding somehow um, to um, being above two or below minus two, then then of course we know that um, that there's something strange about our assumptions that uh, namely the assumptions that a one b one and a two and b two have numerical values and uh, the the thing is that uh, in fact, one can consider even a larger class of correlations um, where the, this value of uh, S is even exceeds uh, two square root of two. They, they were never observed in nature, but, but as it happens, the quantum correlations that exceed 
uh, in S value, the classical correlations uh, were observed and um, and you know there were many experiments. Again, one one would have to give credit to many experimentalists who uh, step by step uh, try to show that the quantum physics is different and indeed that the, the Bell inequality can be violated. But for most of us, probably in, in the most uh, decisive experiment, historically speaking, was one by Alain Asper, who who set up. Uh, this experiment in Institut de Optique in Orsay in 1982. And uh, so you can see on this diagram his lab, it just looks um, already dated. Those experiments today are, are much, much simpler with modern technology. But at the time, I think Alan managed to convince most of people in the field that, uh, yeah, the, the quantum physics uh, really works. On, the, the quantum predictions are the one that the nature cares not about the the classical probability theory and the Bell inequalities are violated. So, so it is not the case that you can really truly attribute numerical values to certain observables before you measure them. So how do we connect this then to the whole notion of um, key distribution and crypto? So think about it this way. If we want to distribute the key using polarized photons, we know that when we make them entangled, they will not carry predetermined values of polarization. So, so somehow, the, if the values you know are not there prior to measurements, the, there's nothing really to eavesdrop on because they're not available to anyone, including potential eavesdropper. So therefore, testing for the violation of Bell inequalities is equivalent for testing for eavesdropper. So somehow the act of eavesdropping makes those values happen and, uh, and then uh, you would just immediately see it by seeing that uh, you will see the, that the Bell inequalities are satisfied in this case. So if you violate the Bell inequality, you know that uh, there was nobody who was touching your precious photons. But if the Bell inequalities are satisfied, then the situation is inc inconclusive. Potentially, there could have been eavesdropping there. But if you see the violation, you know that there was no eavesdropping. Then, of course, you know, there's not like, it's not completely black and white because you may just see a little bit of violation and not too much. So. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm simplifying my narrative. I'm telling you about the extreme cases that, uh, uh, in which case it all works nicely. So in most cases, we can use this setup, um, turn the whole experiment where you care about the foundations of physics into uh, something that is, um, that is in fact the key distribution where Alice and Bob, um, do perform the Bell test uh, and then they incorporate, it's, it's a modified Bell test. It is in, in, they incorporate error correction and they do some privacy amplification. So there's no need to go into technical details. There is, so I'll probably just um, skip those slides unless you're really, really, really interested in knowing all those things, but you can probably read about it. Um, so, so the question was at the time back in the 90s where I started working on this with two colleagues of mine from what used to be called DRA, what was Defense Research Agency in Malvern, not far away from Oxford. Um, the question was, can we translate, can we adapt the, the Bell testing experiment for the purpose of crypto? And, and that's what we did. So working with John Rarity and Paul Tapster and commuting between Oxford and Malvern, essentially we managed to set up um, this experiment. It was kind of you know interesting experience uh, because at the time, um, as it happens in 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 the UK, um, for some historical reasons, all research, all government research on crypto is under the the, uh, the Foreign Office, whereas uh, DRA Malvern was under the Ministry of Defense. So officially, John and Paul were not supposed to be working on anything related to crypto, but, uh, but that was, you know, pure physics and there was no expertise um, among the Cheltenham guys who were working on, on, on classical ciphers. So, so then, then, of course, you know, um, 
at some point uh, when we were still doing those experiments, the management had to just simply agree that they, they, they there's not only fundamental physics and it's also uh, some interesting crypto stuff. And there were many other funny stories, but you know, that's, 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 just, <laughs> that's let's focus on science. Um, so the, um, the thing is that uh, the, the, the degree of violation, I was telling you that uh, the, the main difficulty is not so that to see that you can have secrecy is one thing, but to be able to quantify the secrecy is another thing. Um, so you know that uh, if you have this uh, violation at the level of uh, you know two square root of two, which is at the end of this diagram, then you can uh, you have perfect key security because nobody could touch your photos. But to to do it in cases where you say oh, I'm just a little bit above two, like say my 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 S factor, the, the degree of violation is say two point three or two point four. What then? How much key? How much secret key can I really just extract from the whole thing? So again, uh, that that was uh, that that was something that preoccupied us in the early days. But finally, one can actually um, estimate and can have a good analytical uh, derivation of, of of this key rate, a secret key rate as versus the the violation of the um, of the bell inequalities. But uh, so let's let's sort of like step back and, and think for a moment. The, 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 at this point, I'm just telling you where we were maybe like 20 years ago or so. And uh, it's quite clear that the system is secure. And uh, there are some assumptions here. The system is secure as long as Alice and Bob's labs are secure. So there's no information leak from the labs. And uh, we also made a tacit assumption that Alice and Bob control and trust devices in the labs. So they know what they have, uh, they know how this stuff works. They don't have to trust quite uh, the source of incoming photons, it's just the photons are coming from somewhere, but in a way their devices are testing whether they entangle or not. And we also make, um, again, another subtle assumptions here that Alice and Bob have free will and can choose what to measure without, without any problem. So um, can we somehow weaken those assumptions? So, um, clearly the first one that Alice and Bob labs are secure, that probably will have to stay, right? So it's just, um, a, if someone is just looking inside your lab, is looking at your screen where, where things are not quantum anymore, where you just jotting down or you're just recording that key somewhere, um, then there's just simply no way you can protect uh, the key, the, the, the secret itself. So let's assume that somehow the, those devices are placed in secure labs and there are no information leaks, people are not silly or stupid uh, and leaking information, which of course, you know, is a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough assumption as you probably know. Um, then let's look at the second and the third assumption that Alice and Bob control and trust devices in the lab, because that's actually where the most interesting things happen in quantum crypto. So the next big thing that happened was something that uh, was called device independent. People realized that in fact, you don't have to, if you run this Bell test, uh, you don't have to uh, trust devices. And that's, that's a bit surprising. I have to say that uh, the, 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 the funny thing is that you don't even modify the protocol. You run the protocol that I proposed uh, in, in, in 91 or 90. And, uh, and if you just look at it from a different perspective, the system is even more secure than I originally thought. And so my colleagues um, just found this, you know, I wish I, I could see it <laughs> early when I was working on it, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's always like this, I suppose, that sometimes uh, things uh, that, that uh, you create are much more clever, or the, the protocols are much more clever than, than the originator. So it's at, at least um, I was pleased to learn that uh, one can show that is really the correlations, the outputs that matter, that the system can even, you can operate in a, in a scenario where 
you purchase your equipment from someone whom you don't trust. And the system is somehow self-testing. You run the bell test, and if, uh, if the bell test goes uh, negative, that means bells inequalities are violated. Uh, there's no any other way of doing that, but by just providing those devices with entangled photons that carry a secure key. So that's, uh, that's uh, interesting. And of course, you know, in this case, the key rate, because you, you make some assumptions, the key rate is, um, is much uh, lower. But, um, and it took actually people a while, a while to, to have a, a really good security proof um, for the device independent. In fact, that's, that's something that I would say is the question of the last two, two three years. And so the so probably the most uh, the most convincing now proof that we have came from um, uh, those three colleagues of mine that you can see, and I uh, and it's um, from Renata Rena and uh, um, Rotem and Toma, who um, who worked uh, who worked out something called entropy accumulation theorem. It's known under the acronym EAT. And uh, it allows to essentially reduce the device independence sort of scenario where you cannot make assumption that that uh, you know the the measurements that Alice and Bob make are sort of independent and identically distributed you, because those if in principle if you don't trust your devices and you get those devices from someone else from your enemy. Any, that devices can do anything. They have a very sophisticated memory. They can be designed the most um, sophisticated way, so just to fool you. Um, so Rotem, Arnold Friedman, Renata Ren, and Thomas Vidak, Vidik managed to um, actually come up with a with a, a well. Beautiful. I would like to say it's a beautiful proof. It's a beautiful result, but the, but the, the proof is such that uh, you know I, I I cannot even claim I understand all nitty gritty details. I think probably only Rotem, who was a PhD student working on this proof, uh, really knows uh, all deltas and epsilons in this proof. But um, but I I, <laughs> I do have all reasons to believe at least um, that uh, it works. So so it's it's a it's a beautiful result, which finally sort of ends the story of proving the security for device independent and, and getting a formula for the key distribution. So where does it leave us? So it means that we can, in fact, um, fix the second uh, assumption. We, don't, we, we can weaken it. We don't even assume that Alice and Bob can control and trust devices in the labs. So you see, I'm just pushing towards a uh, um, more paranoid form of security. So now um, you can essentially get devices. And of course, you know, in a real kind of scenario, we are not so much about uh, talking about getting those devices from sources that we cannot trust. Usually it's just, we build those devices ourselves, but we don't trust ourselves either because we can think, oh, maybe there's some stupid side channel in this device, a Trojan horse, which, you know, maybe I just made a a silly mistake in the design. How do I know that if someone who is more clever than me will just look into this and uh, will find a way to break it? So that's that's the thing, that you don't have to. That the device independent scenario allows you to um, protect yourself against making stupid uh, um, design errors in 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 this particular scheme. Because all that is needed then is, of course. Um, uh, you, you really, if you see the violation of the Bell inequalities, uh, it's enough to testify that the device does what it's supposed to be doing. But then again, you know, you just let's look at the last point here, the last assumption that Alice and Bob have free will and then they, they can choose randomly what to measure. That's That's actually not as philosophical as you may think, because in fact, we are not really talking here about the free will that those measurements are given to um, uh, give the, 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 uh, the, there is a piece of technology there are random number generators that decide what to measure not Alice and Bob so there is a bit of a hardware that is as attached to the 
the device that Alice got and the device that Bob's got. And those random number generators are supposed to make random choices for Alice and Bob. Now, of course, if you purchase those random generators from the same untrusted source that you purchase your devices, then, then, then it's pretty bad that, that you, can, you can show that it's not going to work, that the choices that are made um, by Alice and Bob have to be completely independent from uncorrelated with the devices, anything that is uh, going on internal working <clears throat> of the devices. So Alice and Bob have to somehow ensure that this is the case. If they were to get the, uh, if they were to get the, the random devices, random number generators from that uh, the same source, there is a way then, of course, that the system can be broken. So it's interesting that there's been also some work um, about, uh, well, you know, how about the situation where we get a random number generators from untrusted source, but but perhaps you know. There's a little bit of trust there. There's a little bit of genuine randomness that is not um, that is that comes from from us. So how much of genuine randomness we should have in the lab in order to make the system workable? And it turns out that the answer to this question is not that much. Just a little bit, you know, a tiny epsilon of randomness you can use and amplify locally and and use it for for making those choices. So that's another beautiful result. So you don't even have that much. You don't, there's no even that much need for a free will, so to speak, uh, for this system to work. So, so you know, the question is, um, is that, uh, well, actually, that slide is um, redundant. So, yes, yeah, so the question is, uh, can we get there? Well, it's, a, it's been a long way to quantum crypto, and we are certainly going there. All that is needed to get... Um, into the device independent quantum crypto is just to make sure that your detectors and your sources are up to a certain specification and, and you can run what is called um, local free device, a uh, local free test of the Bell inequalities. Um, so there's uh, still a way to go, but you know, crypto is just quantum crypto is making certainly progress. People um, do invest in crypto and uh, remarkable, not only in entanglement based but also prepare and measure systems operational here and there and, and I understand that also in the Emirates uh, you are working on one too and uh, you can have it in on the ground you can have it in space and probably the most uh, well actually I should probably say a few words about this picture here um, one of the first setups uh, for a satellite key distribution was designed in Singapore. But unfortunately, uh, one of the rockets that was supposed to take uh, our small nanocube satellite and put it on the orbit and, and use for the key distribution or test for the generating sources of entangled photon in space. So the, the rocket exploded. It was, you know, you can see all this spectacular explosion. And um, so that's bad. So that was a bad news. But the good news was that sometime later on, the guys managed to find this nano satellite somewhere on the ground. And uh, the source of entangled photon was there and was working perfectly well. So you see that's a robust quantum technology from Singapore. So all of you guys who, who want to invest in quantum technology from space, talk to CQT in Singapore. Those guys really know how to make those things super duper robust. But of course, you know that uh, that you can hardly beat the most spectacular experiments uh, from China these days. They have a dedicated Mishu satellite that is just designed to distribute keys from uh, from um, from the satellites to the to the ground station. So at the moment, they can cover distances over a thousand kilometers or so, and there's much more to come, of course. So I guess um, this probably ends my talk. I would say that. Uh, I was surfing on the sort of um, popular side. There were many technical details that I, I, I didn't cover, I didn't discuss. But if you want to know more, then um, one suggestion is that you just take a look at this review paper that I wrote with Renato Rene on, on the sort of how to push the borders of security. Um, 
or otherwise, you know, there is, of course, uh, a question time. So I'm happy to answer some of your questions, be it technical or popular. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. This was uh, outstanding. I personally learned a lot about what physics uh, tells us about uh, security. So maybe an invitation to the audience, if you have any questions, please put them on the uh, Q&A window. Um, one question, I'll start with a question from my side, Arthur, and probably about the last few slides that you had and where you talk about random amplification. So my question is that if you have untrusted devices or a crypto device, how much does random amplification um, depend on the initial, uh, initial choice of the random sequence that you have uh, and or on the fact that the device is completely compromised? You, you have to have some um, randomness you, you trust that is a true random. The, the, what we know that if you can also have devices that you can trust locally, um, then you can build up for yourself um, amplification, randomness amplification setup, in which case um, the, the seed uh, is, or the, the, the amount of randomness is, can, can be actually as small as possible. The, the, the crucial point is that um, even, you know, that is assuming that device is compromised in such a way that this not so much correlated with the comprom potentially compromised uh, setup for the key distribution. So in other words, if you purchase your key distribution setup together with random number generators, that's pretty bad because in fact, uh, the, your, your enemy can actually make them correlated in such a way, the random number generators and the, the key distribution setup that, that the whole thing is entirely compromised. So if you can, however, make this uh, somewhat, uh, you, you, can, you can sort of break this correlation, in other words, or you can have a little bit of randomness of your own that you know that the, the stuff that you have is not correlated with anything, um, then, then you can actually try to amplify this randomness and use it for, um, for running those compromised devices. So, you know, Najwais, there are so many assumptions around, but, but so that was like a very, sort of like very simplified answer, but uh, which basically says not much randomness of your own. If you, if you can have a little bit of randomness, epsilon, really epsilon, and, and on top of that, if you can actually set up your own, uh, have a few devices also that you can trust on your side, then you can amplify the whole thing. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, we have another question from Abdul Rahman. Um, so the question is, what do you think of the technology behind uh, D-Wave computers or quantum annealers? Right, so, you know, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about um, this. Uh, the D-Wave is, is doing wonderful science, I think. And, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, the way, you know, they started uh, sort of alienated a little bit of the uh, scientific community. Uh, first of all, you know, it is not clear whether annealing can actually, the way the D-Wave sort of presented it can, can really give you a quantum advantage. It depends, you know, it depends on many sort of technical details, but uh, uh, so let, let's leave this question open, right? So it may or may not, depending how you do it. And uh, I would say, I admire what they do for technological sort of uh, experimental work. I think we learn a lot about uh, physics of, of a complex system. So, whereas it's going to be, I'm much more skeptical about uh, this as a tool for quantum computing now. I, I, I think I can speak on behalf of all the audience that we all learned a lot. Um, Arthur, I'd like to thank you once again. Uh, we uh, give you a virtual round of applause and uh, hope to see you uh, very soon.